Hi, and welcome uh, back to another uh, interview and chat about conversation about CVI. As you have already know, I'm uh, Professor John Ravenscroft, and today uh, it gives me enormous pleasure to have a wee chat with Steph Dusing. Uh Hi, Steph, how are you doing? Hi, Dr. Ravenscroft. It's so wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for having me on your program today. I'm so glad to be able to share our perspective on CVI. Ah, that's great. And uh, we've never met before. So this is my first interview actually with someone who I actually don't know. So it's, a, it's, it's great to be with you. It's great to chat with you. And I think what's really important is that, as we'll hear later on in the interview, is to get that parent perspective. Okay, so I've been talking to all sorts of um, uh, professionals, teachers, ophthalmologists, optometrists, but you know, I think parents and children themselves, who are the experts? You're the experts, okay? So I'm really, really, really so pleased that you volunteered, Steph. So thank you very much. Thank you. Like I said, I'm really pleased to be here and very grateful for the opportunity. All right, cool, great. So um, we've had a chat beforehand, just before we came on air, as, as you like, um, uh, but people don't know you, so who are you? <laughs> Well, my name is Stephanie Dusing, and I'm an author of a book called Eyeless Mind, which is the true story of our discovery of Sebastian's almost total blindness at the age of 15. My son Sebastian is the only person in the world known to process his vision verbally, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, but I'm actually a music teacher, and I uh, graduated from the Uni University of Illinois and got a Bachelor of Science in Music Education, and I taught uh, middle school music and chorus for 10 years. And then um, gave birth to my son and took some time off and later went into early childhood music and movement and uh, taught the children's choir at my church and also became a music art and teacher and ran a business from my home teaching music to babies, toddlers, and preschoolers, which I enjoyed very much. Gosh, yeah. Um, uh, you, you look like, um, and your career sounds like someone I know very well, but interestingly enough, during this lockdown, I've been learning the piano. So um, uh, maybe afterwards you could give me some hints. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm mostly actually a voice teacher, so I'm not sure how helpful I will be with your piano. But... Ah, all right, fair enough, good. So, okay, <laughs> look, so as, as you know, I, I, I'm a psychologist and educator, uh, uh, and I'm really interested in early years. And, and what you said there is all about early years. And I'm sort of wondering then, you know, just, just parent, birth, have a child. Can you tell me a little bit about that process when you start to realize and started to recognize that actually Sebastian might have something um, different about his vision? Because it wasn't straight away, was it? It wasn't immediate. It wasn't, that, like, it wasn't straight after the hospital or something like that. So you want to talk me through that a little bit? Yeah, so I almost died giving birth to Sebastian. I had preeclampsia and my blood pressure coded and it dropped to 40 over 26. And I got the six inch needle of epinephrine to my heart and I was unconscious for the next six hours of my labor. When I woke up, I was paralyzed from the chest down and then sometime later um, gave birth to Sebastian. And there was a fetal monitor on him. I was obviously unconscious that time, but my husband tells me that there was no fetal distress. And so obviously I did not have a C-section. And so Sebastian was, I gave birth to him vaginally, and um, we believed at the time that we had a perfectly healthy baby because we were told that he had a nine on his APGAR score. And I, I was a first time mother. The things I noticed in the days and weeks after he was born was that he had sometimes a loose grasp. It wasn't constant, it was sometimes. And I noticed also um, that he was very sleepy in the first months of his birth, like all of my other friends who had babies were saying, oh, I can't get any sleep and they're up all the time. And yes, yeah, Sebastian was up like a typical newborn every two hours during the night, which is pretty normal. But during the day, I felt like my son was napping way more than my other friends were and okay. he seemed to just sleep all the time. And I brought my concerns about that to the attention of his, um, obviously pediatric, uh, what do you call that, pediatrician or whatever. Pediatrician. Yeah. Yeah, and I was just told I had a very sleepy baby, and I just assumed it was maybe a side effect from the epidural, and my concerns about the loose grasp, I mean, it was just brushed off. He's just a very sleepy baby, is what I was told repeatedly. So, um, I, as I said, I'm an early childhood music and movement specialist, and 
I'm just a music teacher by nature. And when I brought Sebastian home, he actually received intensive music and movement therapy from birth just because I think it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I think all moms sing lullabies to their babies, but Sebastian got more than that. Sebastian, I danced with him every day throughout the day. I bounced him, I rocked him. And there is literally two decades of research going back demonstrating that music in early childhood has just enormous neurological benefits. There's two decades of research showing that music in early childhood benefits balance, proprioception, fine and gross motor skills, coordination. It improves um, auditory discrimination. It actually improves um, language development. It improves higher order thinking skills. Rhythm actually improves the development of the frontal lobes of the brain. There's decades of research showing this because music is actually the only activity known that forces both sides of the brain to work together through the corpus callosum. It actually activates the auditory, motor, and visual cortices at the same time. It's the only activity that does that. And so they've known for more than two decades that musicians' brains are actually different from ordinary people's brains. They are, yeah. and they've known that. And so Sebastian received intensive music and movement therapy just because I was having fun with him in my music teacher way at home, having no idea that I didn't have a healthy baby. And he, we have photos of him um, from his earliest days making eye contact, and he's completely face blind. Gosh. And it's from his earliest days, we have photos of him making eye contact. We have photos of him making visual guidance of reach, which is where you look at a target and then you reach for it. Mm -hmm. And my blind son was using visual guidance of reach as an infant. And so we, we had no idea that there was anything wrong with him visually at all because he had all normal developmental milestones. He sat up on time. He walked at 13 months. He was running, he was skipping, he was jumping. He did everything. The tiny little things that we noticed that were slightly different, I know now that my son taught himself to run by using his blankie as like an object detector. When uh -huh. he got excited, he would take his blankie and he would whirl it like a windmill and he would just run around. And it, looked, it was always done with so much joy and enthusiasm that we just thought it was cute. But we know now that was his object detector and he was using that as a tool to make sure he didn't crash into anything and he never did. Yeah, yeah. it's really interesting. It's only when you start to reflect back and what you know now, of course, and you go, oh, okay. So that's, you know, that's what he was doing there. But you don't yep. know, do you? You know, when you're, when you're a first time mom kind of thing, you just don't know and you, and you got this. You got a you got a, a boy running around swirling the blankie. Oh, it's fantastic fun, you know. Yeah, and he's laughing like crazy and having a joyous time, and he's not fearful, right? I mean, it was just cute. This is just you know a two year old running around with his blankie, you know. So we know that now, but at the time, that was it was so subtle to see what could have been wrong, you know. So, the, like, I don't think anyone and any doctor in the world is going well if they whirl their blankie around, they must be blind. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> Look, any parent who's got a child whirling their blankie around, look, it's 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 fine, right? It, it's okay. So it's just, right. Just, yeah, yeah. Yeah. right. Right. So it, it, that's what we saw in, in hindsight. You know, it's like that was a clue, you know, but it was not something obvious. And Sebastian never never bumped into things, ever. He never was banging into things. He was, the behavior was all totally normal. The only things that were different was that Sebastian actually was reading and writing at the age of two and a half. Oh, okay. And, <laughs> Yeah, and he, um, I literally was, he asked to play school, and, you know, we were, I was a stay-at-home mom with him, and he was an early riser, and he used to get up at 4.45 in the morning, and there's not a lot to do, like, out in public between 4.45 in the morning and 10 a.m., which is when he wanted to have lunch, <laughs> you know, so we would play school if he wanted to, and we had one of those um, etch not etch-a-sketches, but the uh, Magna Doodles, you know. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And so when he was about two, two and a half, he wanted to play school. And so I did the alphabet on the, on the, on the magnet, the extra sketch. And I just did it dot to dot. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. traced the dots. And we did each capital letter one time. And yep. then I didn't think, didn't think anything of it. And then a couple of weeks later, he wanted to play school again. And so, you know, we read some stories and I did the magnet doodle every capital letter one time. And then we were a few weeks later at the playground and there's a sand volleyball court and Sebastian was two and a half years old and he picked up a stick 
and he started writing the alphabet at two and a half in the sand correctly. And I'd only shown him twice. Gosh, gosh, gosh. Each letter twice. So when did you, so let, let, let's just fast forward a little bit then. Um, and, and Sebastian went to, uh, um, what do you call, general education primary school, to mainstream school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he, was, he was reading and um, understanding the original Nancy Drew series that I struggled with as like a second and third grader. He was reading and understanding them when he was four. Yeah. So he was identified as gifted when he entered kindergarten. And he, his gifted teacher actually created a special program just for him. Um, specifically for him because he was so far advanced. And then when he was in third grade, um, at Christmas time, his gifted teacher actually came running up the building in, the, in December when it was like 20 degrees outside without a coat on to tell me that Sebastian had actually finished the fourth grade math book first quarter of third grade without any help. We didn't even know he'd finished it. We'd never coached him on anything. And so she told me that the school could not meet his needs academically at his grade level and that he needed to be moved ahead to the next grade for grade promotion. And we actually fought it for social reasons. Sebastian had a really good network and a really close best friend in the grade he was in. We didn't know any kids in the grade above. We didn't want to. And so we actually fought the grade promotion and it turned out that it was by far the least bad of the three choices we were given. And so we did go ahead with the grade promotion because they literally was nothing else we could do. Sure. And it, it was, you know, was fine. And um, Sebastian has always scored in the 99th percentile in both math and English on all standardized testing without any preparation whatsoever. Gosh, gosh, excellent. Wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not going to be me. <clears throat> particularly in the maths, but hey, that's another day. So, yeah. um, so, so moving on then, when did you first then start? So, so you've got a wonderful boy, he's doing exceptionally well at school, got a close knit mm -hmm. circle of friends, you know, he's got a good best friend. Ah, oh, joy, joyous, you know? So when did you first think, hang on, hang on, whoa, 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 is, this, is this right? Is this, is this typical? Is, does, this, does this happen all the time? So, so when, when was your first? Yeah, there were things. There were things. And so when Sebastian began, um, well, actually, it was just after we moved. Uh, when Sebastian was two, we moved to a different house. And just after he turned two, after we moved, he started to express anxiety about going places like the grocery store and to gymnastics class. And he called it a game. He called it the I'm nervous game. And he'd never had tantrums. But he would just say, as I was taking him to the grocery store, the same one, you know, we'd been going to for some time, and he would say, I'm nervous, mom. I'm nervous. And I, I was just mystified. I was like, why would you be nervous to go to the grocery store? But he would just say it again and again, I'm nervous. I'm nervous. And I, like, and he would say, I'm gonna, I want to play the nervous game. And he called it a game, and he didn't have tantrums. And so when I brought it to the attention of his doctors, his doctor said, well, sometimes, you know, kids can seek negative attention. And, you know, he just tried distracting him with something else. And that's what I did. And he stopped telling me. Right. He stopped okay. telling me that he was nervous. So that was when he was two. And then when he started preschool at the age of three, then he started to express... Um, separation anxiety. He cried every day at drop off for preschool for two years and then frequently in kindergarten as well, even though he was, he has an October birthday and um, was one of the older kids in the class and was very outgoing and social and got along with everybody and he had friends and he still was crying. You know, his best friend was in preschool with him and he would cry at drop off and it was mystifying. And the, he would tell me he literally for two years of preschool cried about not having algebra in preschool. And I didn't know how he knew the word algebra. <laughs> it didn't ever come up in my conversations with my three-year-old, you know, and we know now it was probably his seventh grade babysitter, his 12 year old babysitter probably brought homework over and was doing algebra while he was drawing or something. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> and he picked it up from her or somebody, you know, cause I'm like, I don't He's like, when do I get to take algebra? And he's sobbing like his heart is breaking. And I'm like, you're three. I cried to stop taking algebra. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't, 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 don't. <laughs> when do I get to quit? You know, and he was sobbing because, you know, we know children who have CVI or are born with it, they, don't, they just assume their vision's typical. 
Yeah, and no, I to compare it to. So he could not say, I'm scared because I'm not getting white cane training and I need orientation and mobility services and I can't recognize my friends and my, my teacher. He, but he's, he knew he wasn't getting algebra because his babysitter told him he couldn't have it till he was in seventh grade. So he cried about having, not getting algebra because he knew he wasn't getting that. He couldn't tell me I'm scared because I can't see. Yeah. Because he didn't know that he couldn't see. You know, so it can be really subtle, the symptoms and the way the, 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 the way the anxiety from not getting the services they need and not being identified, the way that they expressed it can look like something completely different than what it actually is. So we've, we've, we've talked a little bit about Sebastian's behaviors in terms of face blindness uh, and other issues, but do you want to, do you want to describe for us just so that um, if, if that's okay with you, of course, and of course, if you don't want to, that's that's absolutely fine, and I totally understand. Just some of, some of the um, the behaviours you notice, you know, obviously you've noticed some of the face blindness, but there are other things we were talking about. So, do you want to give us a, a, a like a, a summary uh, a, a, of Sebastian's visual behaviours? Well. Um... So I'll tell you about his CBI, what his symptoms are and what he has. So Sebastian has both dorsal and ventral stream impairment. His dorsal stream impairment is characterized by difficulty spotting a distant target and also by visual crowding. And the bizarre thing is, is that my son loves jigsaw puzzles and I have a six foot long 5,000 piece Ravensburger puzzle hanging on my wall in the basement right now that he put together. And yet he also has visual crowding issues and it's just a mystery how he can have both, but he does. So anyway, um, those are two things that he has, but he also has the ventral stream processing dysfunction really severely. And so Sebastian, he has no ability to recognize faces, places, objects, or biological forms. He can't recognize his own hands, face, or body. And yet my son draws and paints faces and everything else that interests him with photographic realism when he wants to. Right, okay, so, so if, if you ask Sebastian to draw a face, it's not like the eyes are up here and the, the nose is down here somewhere, some kind of some Picasso kind of representation. It's not like that at all. No, Sebastian actually received the Presidential Award and Scholarship to the School of the Art Institute in Chicago, which is their highest award. And he had three artworks on exhibit at the Albert Kemper Museum in St. Joseph, Missouri at the age of 17. He does not really actually consider himself to be primarily a uh, 2D artist. He works in 3D. He does ceramics. He does sculpture. He's taking fashion courses this next fall, assuming life goes back to normal. He does large-scale sculpture. He, he, does, he creates and binds his own books. He just does everything. He's a maker. He has been all his life. And we know that Sebastian quite literally gave himself art therapy as a child. He's been doing this his whole life. Great. And, yeah. I mean, it's great to hear the, the success uh, and great to hear the success just just to be clear again he doesn't recognize biological forms his face no. okay, faces faces uh, uh, arms legs all of that no so for sebastian the only things that he can recognize the way that typically sighted people do are words letters and numbers sebastian actually uses um pantomiming I don't know if there's another word for it, to recognize shapes. Sebastian, when he wants to create a visual image of a shape, if he moves any body part or even thinks about moving any body part in a simple shape, he gets a brief mental image of it. And so he can do that for circles, for squares, triangles, rectangles. He says hexagons are iffy. Of that, he can't do them at all. And so, but for words, letters, and numbers, he recognizes those just like everybody else. And his visual world is very much like being out in the middle of a foggy ocean. And so everywhere he goes, it's, he has simultanagnosia. And so what that means is he has a teeny tiny patch of acuity in the center of his visual field. And when he is reading, he can usually see two, maybe three letters at a time in 10 point font. And then his visual fields are full they go all the way out just like normal, but they're so blurry that he can only use that part of his visual field to detect light, motion, and really vague blurry shapes. And so for him, his functional vision is like being out in the middle of a, of a foggy ocean. 
yeah. everywhere he goes all the time. And he could see if, if like street signs and store signs float past him and he can see them, but they're not attached to any recognizable object or store or location. There's nothing else ever looks familiar to him anywhere he goes. So he's completely unable to create mental maps of the world because he, you, in order to create a mental map of the world, you have to have some concept of where things are in relationship to each other. That's a, a, that's a really, really good description. And the, immediately, and I don't know if you've seen it, um, Dr. Andrew Blakey's, I think it's on the CVI web, um, Scotland website. His, um, he's got a video there of um, a person with CVI who we know, who we both know actually, uh, uh, walking on the beach. And uh, along the beach, uh, it's exactly as you described. Um, when, the, when the beach is full and, and looking at um, uh, items on the beach, that visual world just becomes this fog clutter. You can't see. You just can't see. You don't know what's there. You don't know what's there. But interesting enough, for this person, and we recognise that for everyone else, CVI is uh, is unique. But for yeah. this person, if 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 they not are not looking at that visual clutter world, or just looking at a vast open space, uh, this person's vision just expands, right? You know, and they can see more, right? Their their visual field becomes. Uh, uh, typical in some sense uh, mm -hmm. but as soon as you impose that better visual clutter it comes back down and very much very similar to that fog you're describing about Sebastian now I don't know if that happens with Sebastian or not we talked about it yeah, we have talked about it, and Sebastian does not experience that. He actually finds like wide open spaces to be uncomfortable for him, and right. I don't know exactly why. So he is not experiencing that sense of relief or better vision out in the wide open. For him, it's not like that. I don't know. Well, 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 well. Who knows? I mean, like you say, <laughs> every every person with CVI is unique, and yep. their CVI is unique, and so you know, who knows. But it's just, just interesting that description of the fog was exactly how this person describes it, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's just exactly as that. All right, mm -hmm. good. Thanks for, thanks for that full description. So, so, so do you want to know more about um, like some of the symptoms that we saw? Because okay. I, yeah, I have yeah, more yeah, information yeah, about yeah. that. So, so I told you about the crying about the algebra in preschool, you know, the separation anxiety, and it was so mystifying. And, you know, when I brought that to the attention of his teachers and doctors, and again, it was very just minimized. It was like, you know, he, he always settles down really quickly, and we worry about the ones who can't settle down. And my son, you know, he would cry briefly when I dropped him, and then he would go and sit down in his chair, and he'd be fine. He would look like he was fine. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I can, I can get that. You know, he settles down, becomes quiet. Mm -hmm. And he appears to be fine. And so that went on until he, he skipped a grade, as I told you, and went through the entire grade promotion process where they look at his academic, intellectual, social, physical, every part of his development. And he sailed through the process. He was rated very athletic by his PE teacher. My son has always all his life gotten an A in gym class. <laughs> My blind son. <laughs> yeah, that's another thing that's not happening with me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was very much a C student in gym. Yes, I'm like, I don't know where this kid came from. <laughs> so yeah, my blind son is getting A's in gym every quarter. There's not a single red flag, nothing. And so he went through that process and had a fabulous time in fifth grade. First time he's ever had anything in class where there was new material for him to learn that he didn't already know. He's talking to me. Everything's fabulous. And then at the end of fifth grade in the U.S. here in our school district, after fifth grade, they changed to a different school and go to middle school. And he realized that, you know, he was still friends with his friends from before, even though they had changed, he had changed a grade. But he realized that the next year he would be going to a new school and his friend wouldn't be coming with him. And he grieved like his friend was dying. And he was saying things like the world would explode if he didn't get straight A's and... <laughs> My husband and I are actually against an anti-homework and standardized testing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we are like, no child should ever have homework before they're like 12. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, we, we're not like the ones at Kumon drilling things. We, I mean, none of that is coming from us. So it was very disconcerting and concerning for me to like, where's this pressure coming from for this child that he feels like if he doesn't get straight A's, the whole world will explode. And those are his words. And, um, and he started to tell us he was afraid he would get lost at the new school. Okay. And he, he cried about it every day for three months saying those three things. I'm afraid I'm going to get lost, grieving for his friend that he was leaving behind and saying the world would explode if he didn't get straight A's. And so I immediately sought help for him immediately. And he was misdiagnosed. And I mean, I remember sitting there in the therapist's office going, why would he be so afraid of getting lost? Why, if there's not a real fear, why would he be so afraid? And the answer is, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, if, if, if you can say, what was the original diagnosis? Was it just some kind of was, anxiety about going to school? Or, yeah, yeah, no, they, they, she, she, the, the therapist diagnosed him with anticipational anxiety. Right, okay. You know, and that some people get anxious when something, a change is coming. Yeah, new, and, new stuff happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so what happened was, you know, we, we, so, okay, well, this is what this is. And then on the very first day that Sebastian was allowed into his new school, well, of course, you know, it's a modern school building that, you know, it's a big rectangle and it's exceptionally well marked with signs for where the library is and the art wing. And you know what I mean? It's really easy to navigate yeah. this building. And we walked in on the first day for parents and students to come and find their lockers. And Sebastian memorized his steps and turns on his first trip through the building because it was so easy, you know, just mentally, because he's, yeah, sure. he, did you, we did, didn't know that he was doing that thing. No, could you, we, could you, no. Could you tell he was going one, two, turn left, six, no. seven? Nope. Oh my gosh, no, it's all mental, you know? And so we walked through the building once and then again, and you know, there was, had been so much drama and anxiety for the three months before he went there that I was the one going, are you sure you don't want to walk it again? Are you sure? You, are you sure you know where you're going? Are you ready for Monday? And he's like, can we just go get lunch, mom? You know what I mean? He's just like, yeah, it's fine. So it looked like anticipational anxiety because the day he got in that building, it was gone. It yeah, yeah, yeah. It went, it went gone and things like that. Yeah. yeah. It was completely gone. And then, you know, the, the following, when he went into high school that year, oh my goodness, his high school was designed in the 1970s by, I think, a lunatic. <laughs> It was an open concept school. I don't think there's any right angles in the building. <laughs> it's just, and then of course it's been added on to twice. And it's one of these buildings yeah, where yeah, yeah. you have two wings and you can't get from the third floor on this wing to the third floor on this wing. And you have to go down and back up. I actually substitute taught there before we knew Sebastian had CBI one time and I had a map and I never went back. <laughs> Because I, I just had no idea where anything was. It was so difficult to navigate. And so when Sebastian started high school and we went into that building, you know, they give they know that building's really hard. Every year at graduation, the seniors talk about how awful it was as freshmen when they came in and they didn't know where anything was and how long it took them to find their classes. It's just a known thing. And so Sebastian and I had to come back probably three times to walk his schedule to figure out where everything was that summer before freshman year and everybody else was doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. the same, yeah. That's right. So like, it wasn't like, oh, my son's different. It was everybody's in the same boat. And, and so uh, it was, everything was masked. Every single thing was masked by something else. And so, you know, he went into freshman year, it was very successful, everything's good. And then we were going through old photos. He got a concussion in the fall and um, totally unrelated to the CBI. And we just had going through old photos that we hadn't gone through for years and years and years. And I was narrating to him about like who the different people in the photos were because there was, you know, cousins from Canada we hadn't seen in 10 years and neighbors from Woodridge he hadn't seen since he was a toddler, you know. So I was just saying, oh, there's these people and there's these people. And then we've been doing that for half an hour, him seeing pictures of himself as a baby and a toddler and all these pictures. And then suddenly a picture came up on my computer screen of him sitting in my brother's lap and I mean it's obviously Sebastian and it's obviously my brother and they you know they know each other well and and I it was such a cute picture I just went oh look who's that <laughs> and there's the crickets 
Sebastian's like, how would I know? Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. So, so, you, so let me just get that scene right. So you're there. You, you, Sebastian's with you. He's, he's a, he's a um, I don't know, 14, 13, 12? I think he was, he was 15. 15. And it's clearly him with his uncle uh, mm -hmm. clearly him yeah you could see I, I mean i look at photos of me and it's clearly me right and you're just going uh, and wow who's that as you would as you would and, he, and this is the very first time and, and he says something like i don't know who's that God. yeah he had wow. no idea wow he had no idea and so then there were other pictures of like me <laughs> and eric from you know from <laughs> Who's this? Who's this? <laughs> yeah, and he was he was guessing, you know, he was guessing but not knowing. And I was just like, that's not normal. And I had never heard of CBI. I had never heard of face blindness. I'd never heard of it. And so you can imagine the shock because it was like, okay, my kid draws and paints faces. I mean, with photographic realism, it looks real yeah, yeah. when he wants to. And like, what is this? You know, it was it gave me the chills. I was so concerned about him, you know, and then the very next day we discovered he taught himself to count his steps and turns as a toddler and was navigating our own home that way. All right. So it, al it almost cascaded from that moment then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. All of a sudden it's like, okay, there's something wrong, you know, so. You know, and that. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, so uh, you realize something's wrong here and then it's all the next few days, you know, you're talking with Sebastian and all of a sudden you find out he's counting steps, doing these things, he's doing this stuff and, and all, all sorts of other stuff. So, so now let, let's put a clock on it. Uh, so now let's begin your journey to diagnosis, right? So, so, so let, 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 we're putting the clock, bing, right? Uh, uh, and I'm on it now. So, so tell me about that then, because that's a journey. It was a journey and... We're so grateful to the people who eventually came to our rescue because it was a nightmare, I'll be honest. So Sebastian had had a completely unrelated concussion in the previous fall and had just recently in December of that year um, had a full neuropsych evaluation for the concussion yeah. because he, he was having, it was a really bad concussion and he was having difficulty getting over it. And so on his neuropsych evaluation, he scored a perfect 150 on the verbal portion of the IQ test. and he was borderline impaired in visual spatial. And yeah. that was very concerning. I was like, that's not normal. What does this mean? <laughs> and the doctor's like, oh, he's fine. He just needs a few more weeks to get better. You know, he'll, it's all fine, whatever. So I was like, there was a note in his neuropsyche valve that said possible NVLD. And I had never heard of nonverbal learning disabilities. So I was, of course, what is this? How can a child who scores in the 99th percentile on all math and English standardized tests is a straight and honor student, is an athlete and has friends, where's the disability, right? And they're like, well, in this case, you know, they probably, there probably isn't. But it's just in there, just, you know, maybe there might be. And I'm like, well, what is the disability? And well, well, it doesn't really apply to Sebastian. Okay. So I'm not getting any answers. And then we discover Sebastian's face blind. We discover he's been navigating by counting his steps and turns. And so the first person I turn to, of course, is the neuropsych person because it's obviously neurological. Yeah. I know it's not, a, not an ocular thing. It's obviously neurological. Yeah. So immediately I make an appointment with the neuropsych. And this person does not believe either one of us and says, I can't help you. And I don't know anyone who can. Good luck with that. Gosh. That was where we were left. And it was like a clown car <laughs> trying to get a diagnosis for Sebastian because nobody believed us. We went from doctor to doctor to doctor to doctor. And we saw optometrists, neurooptometrists, ophthalmologists, neuro-ophthalmologists, we saw psychologists, psychiatrists, we saw neuropsychologists, and we traveled across the United States looking for anyone who could help us. And we were labeled crazy by the medical establishment, and I was using the correct medical terminology to describe my son's symptoms from the very first appointment. Mm -hmm. I did my research, I knew he had prosopagnosia, I knew he had topographic agnosia, I knew was suspicious that he had object agnosia, although it was hard for me to believe given how successful he is at everything. 
you know, so I was using that terminology to describe my son's symptoms, and we were the targets of horrific malpractice. We were repeatedly verbally and emotionally abused by doctors. Doctors lied to us. They hid our own medical records from us. My son scored in the severely impaired range on a prosopagnosia face blindness test, and then the doctors hid that record from us so that we didn't have any evidence of my son, the one piece of evidence that we had that there was something wrong with my son. It's okay. It's all right, Steph. I, I, I can press pause. Do you want me to pause? Yeah. All right, well, so uh, clearly, clearly, Steph, it was a, a terrible time, right? It was, it was a, a terrible time and, and difficulties in trying to uh, uh, understand, understand what's happening when, you know, when you're presented with your son. Uh, so, so eventually, though, eventually things got better for you. So how did, how, how did that happen? Well, we were really fortunate because um, right away, within days after discovering that Sebastian had um, CDI, I reached out to the Seeing Eye Guide Dog Organization because we knew we were really, really lucky that the only impairment, given how severely visually impaired my son is, that the only help he needed was with navigation and that he needed white cane training. And we knew that. And so I was wondering whether a guide dog would help Sebastian. So I reached out to the seeing eye and I talked for a while with um, Pauline Surf Alexander and she was so lovely on the phone. And, you know, she just said, well, does he bump into things? And I said, no, he's never bumped into anything. He's been riding his bike since he was four without training wheels, you know, and she said, well, the guide dog probably wouldn't be a good match, you know, and, and, and I was, I agreed with that because I'm like, I don't want to take a $50,000 animal from someone who needs it more, right? Yeah, yeah. So my concern was just having Sebastian alone in the world, you know, as a blind person, I really thought the guide dog would be like comforting for him, but I didn't want to take one if he didn't actually need it. And so we just left the conversation at that and I was comforted, but, you know, still a little disappointed and never thought I'd hear another thing from the seeing eye. Because there was no like, oh, well, we'll have someone call you. It's just like, oh, okay, it's not a good match. And a few days later, Lucas Frank from The Seeing Eye called. And he was amazing on the phone. He's the senior consultant there. And he actually spent a lot of time talking to me about how we discovered what was going on with Sebastian, what symptoms we saw. And then he talked to Sebastian on the phone for quite some time. And again, um, at the end of the conversation, he came back to me and you know, we talked about how it probably wouldn't be a good match. And he explained about how a guide dog has to completely trust the owner and all this stuff. And, and you know, because Sebastian gets around without bumping into things, he might like not take the guide dog's suggestions. And then if you do that, you subvert the guide dog's yeah, training yeah. and it becomes yeah. a pet. Right. So, and I'm like, well, that's really good for me to understand because I, I didn't know anything about guide dogs before. Right. Yeah, yeah. So... <laughs> So it was really helpful and we, you know, we had a wonderful conversation and we just ended it there and I thought I'd never hear from Lucas again and you know because I was just like that was I was so touched that he called and that his obvious caring I was like that was so kind that you know that he actually reached out and then we just continued you know of course this was right at the beginning I had no idea what kind of adventure we were going to be in for to get a diagnosis for Sebastian and get a few weeks of white cane training for him <laughs> which was all we ever asked for you know not a lobotomy <laughs> the way we were treated so anyway um uh you know we had one problem with the doctor after another after another and at some point in april months later i get a phone call from lucas no, all right okay yeah, yeah yeah and he said i'm flying out to chicago for a conference would you like to have dinner and by this point i was starting to feel a little desperate so i was like yes i would like to have dinner and so we went to a local restaurant one of our favorite restaurants and um we met Lucas there and he did an informal orientation and mobility evaluation of Sebastian in the restaurant and out in the parking lot. And this is what he does. I mean, he, you know, and he's really amazing. And he could very clearly tell that my son was not navigating the way that a typically sighted person does. And it was so validating to have a person to recognize what I saw, you know, and who would listen. The yeah. fact that he would so this listen. Would be almost the very first time then that someone went, ah, hang on, you might be right here. Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, was open to it and could and would just actually ask Sebastian what he was doing and listen to Sebastian's answers. Because Sebastian can explain his own functional vision. <laughs> well, well, ask, well ask, ask the child. Well, that's, uh, 
That's yeah, right. how's that for an answer? Revolutionary, yeah. revolutionary, right? To actually ask the person who has it what they're doing, how they're doing it, what they can see, what they have difficulty with. And it was shocking because none of the doctors were doing that. Nobody. We actually went for six months and not one single doctor asked my son what he could see. Right, right. Okay. Nobody yeah. even asked really us what he could see. That, um, well, I'm just thinking back now, which is why we, we use in, inventories, you know, the, the CVI questionnaires kind of thing, you know, is why, that's why we ask that, those things, isn't it? Right. We ask the parents and we ask the child a whole list of these type of questions, you know, that's this, this, rather than going straight into any kind of formal testing, let's take this history, you know, let's take this CVI history, let's, let's yeah. do that. So, um, uh, so for all of you people out there, that CVI history is important. Don't forget it. All right, sorry about that. Just a bit of teaching. <laughs> <laughs> happy, I'm happy to have you teach. All right. Yeah, so, so we had this informal evaluation, you know, with no paperwork or anything, completely informal, but it was hugely validating and like renewed my hope, you know. So then Lucas goes on with his life and, you know, gives Sebastian his card and says, call him anytime. And I know, I'm just like, well, that was nice. That was, I didn't expect anything else. You know, and so then we continued on with our medical voyage thinking, well, now surely someone will believe us, right? And why were we wrong? <laughs> and we just kept going and it kept getting worse and worse and worse. And um, finally, um, uh, I was in contact with Lucas by text during the, a really bad situation with uh, the medical thing. And we were told that we needed family therapy and that um, antidepressants would cure my son's vision, but not his auditory processing disorder because the curing the vision was like a side effect of the medication. <laughs> a neurologist well, that, told me that. that. This is like just outrageous. But anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what I was told. So of course I was texting with Lucas and he was like, well, what do they say about this? And what do they say about that? And I'm like, they're not answering our questions. They're just treating us like we're lunatics. And, you know, so coming home from that trip across the country was devastating. I can't even tell you how yeah. devastating it was. So I, we, I don't, we don't need to go into that. So yeah. yeah. Just but, what that drive, that trip is like, you know. Yeah. But anyway, so a day or two later, I get a phone call from Lucas. <laughs> I never met the guy and I love him. He's amazing. And he says, Jim Dermick is the head of rehabilitation at the Johns Hopkins Eye Clinic and he wants to talk to you now. And I was like, okay. <laughs> he he yeah. said, don't, don't cry when you talk to him. <laughs> and I said, I can't promise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, I called Jim and Jim was wonderful on the phone. He asked me about Sebastian and everything going on. And he said, um, we have a course on CBI. And somewhere in the, that was right around the time, I, right in this time period is when I first heard the word cerebral cortical visual impairment for the first time. I'd been correctly using the terms prosopagnosia and everything else. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. But rather, yeah just, just individual terms and yeah. Yeah. And I never heard of cerebral or cortical visual impairment from any of the doctors. No one had even mentioned it. So he signed me up for free, this $150 course on CVI taught by Dr. Gordon Dutton. No, mm -hmm. I know him. <laughs> and it was, it, was, uh, it was Memorial Day weekend when I started the course. And it was like a six-hour, two-credit-hour course in CVI. And I took it over the weekend, and I got an A. And on Tuesday morning hey, after hey, the hey, holiday... <laughs> Yes. And I'm taking the course and I'm like, check, 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 check. He has this, he has this, he has this. Everything makes sense. I'm like, why is no one teaching this to the people who should be diagnosing this? Nobody knows anything about this. And it's not difficult to understand. And it's so logical. And it's, it's so easily to absorb. I mean, I just, it just shocked me to take this course and be like, this is not difficult. How come nobody knows what this is? Right. So... Yeah. Tuesday morning, I send an email to Jim Dermaic and I said, okay, I got an A in the course, <laughs> now what do I do? He eventually, even with his help here in the US, even after taking the course, even having, after even more information, I still couldn't get help in the US from doctors here. Even okay. with that. This is when, what, 2000 and what? 
This was 2000 and 2017. Oh, right. Okay. This so was May of 2017. Not that long ago. Okay. No. I was going to say 10 or something, but I guess yeah, my maths is wrong. You see, I never got that grade A in maths, right? So, um, <laughs> me neither. <laughs> so, yeah, 2017. Yeah. Okay. So we had discovered Sebastian's vision impairment in January of 2017. It's now May of 2017. We still don't have a diagnosis. And even after taking the course, I find myself standing in a doctor's office explaining who Dr. Gordon Dutton is and showing him the textbook and explaining what CVI is to the doctor, right? And the doctor's never heard of CVI and has never heard of Dr. Gordon Dutton and has never seen the 600 page textbook and doesn't know anything about it. And so I'm like, okay, I'm done. I'm just going to find Dr. Gordon Dutton. <laughs> so I, I was like looking on LinkedIn and stuff and finally I just found CBI Scotland and I sent an email to CBI Scotland and I think it was Helen St. Clair Tracy probably who connected me to Gordon. He responded I think the next day and it was so amazing because in my email I just explained who I was and you know Jim Dermick and Lucas Frank and the basics of what we had discovered. You know it was probably just a couple paragraphs and he replies back like I'm completely sane. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, six months of being treated like a lunatic and to have someone say, yeah, how can I help you? You know, and so that's how Dr. Gordon Dutton set us up with Dr. Sylvie Chacon in Paris. And because he's, he's retired from ophthalmology. And so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so he doesn't see patients. And so he suggested, he said the only person in the world that he would recommend at that time to see would be Dr. Chacon because they had very similar ideas about CBI. And so he actually made the introduction and they collaborated on creating sort of a research study on Sebastian. And so we went for a week to Paris and um, Dr. Chakram was amazing. And one of the problems that we had getting a diagnosis with Sebastian is that he has a normal appearing brain scan. His MRI appears to be normal. Okay. And so that was part of the reason no one would believe that there was anything wrong with him. And we know now that 10% of cerebral palsy patients also have normal appearing MRI and they still have CP. And it's believed that it's about the same percentage for people who have CBI. So there's problems with, you know, PVL, periventricular leukomalacia, and, you know, some people have that and it just goes undiagnosed because doctors don't know what to look for. So they might not have a normal MRI, but they, it, it's missed. So that's an issue. So we went to Paris and Dr. Chakran actually did a SPECT scan on Sebastian. And a SPECT scan is a nuclear medicine test. And it looks for the blood flow in the brain and it measures the function of the brain rather than the structure. And any areas of the brain that aren't receiving any blood flow, those are dead tissue. And so Sebastian has pretty significant brain damage from the birth trauma that we went through. And it doesn't show on the MRI, but it sure shows on the SPEC scan. And so we know that Sebastian has brain damage from that. Gosh, gosh. And that's, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just thinking how many people get SPEC scans, you know, it's not, oof, yeah, very few. Yeah. And, you know, when I was trying, came home to the U.S. then with this, you know, report from the SPEC scan and the, the doctors don't even know what it is what it is right because i think a lot of doctors in the u.s don't get trained in it so they don't even understand it or you know how it's used or what the benefits are and i think there's a lot of people who have cvi who could benefit from this because then you would have an idea of exactly where in the brain the brain damage is and we know where in the brain many visual processing things happen you know like the right fusiform gyrus of the brain and prosopagnosia and the links towards that and I really do think it's cruel to tell people, well, we just we can't know what the CBI people, what their problems are, when we do have a good idea of where in the brain different things are processed. And parents should be able to know when they bring their baby home from the hospital that if there's at risk, they should know, oh, they have brain damage in this area, in this area. They might have problems with navigation. They That's might like, have- Keep an eye on this, look at this, you know, report it to this, you know, and then we can do some early intervention techniques and early intervention strategies that, that may help and support, absolutely. Right. Yeah, and this whole just shrugging your shoulders and being like, we just can't know, it's unknowable. No one can possibly guess. <laughs> <laughs> all right so look, look 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 tell me now then um uh, uh, uh i've got a couple of more questions and then we'll, we'll end it there but um look 
we've been on a we've been on a journey together on this um uh, on this media here. Tell me how well Sebastian's doing now. All right. So tell me tell tell me some good stuff. Right. I want to hear some good stuff. Right. He's great. Thank you for asking. He's absolutely great. He lives independently and travels across the country. Um, he was able to get white cane training through the Leader Dogs for the Blind, and they were wonderful. And they flew him out free of charge for a week, and he got wonderful, wonderful support there. And he actually doesn't use his white cane very often. Sebastian experiences pretty severe visual tiring, and he needs it for when he goes completely blind. If he gets sick suddenly or if he gets overheated, he actually goes completely blind when those things happen to him. And so he needs for safety to have white cane training for the times when his vision is so poor that he can't see anything. Yeah. So he got white cane training and he does travel across the country by himself to visit friends. And, um, you know, he just, he does his thing and he's, he got this, like I said, the scholarship to the School of the Art Institute and he is loving it. Absolutely Good. loving it. So couldn't, couldn't be happier. All right, that's uh, uh, that, that that's great. That that's just great, man. You know, that's just great. So um, one thing, one thing that um, uh, 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 I do. So what I do, I train. Uh, um, or in in the UK, we call educate the um, the teachers of visual impairment. QTVIs is what we call them. Qualified. The Q stands qualified. You see. So okay. When you when you're when you're on the program, you're not qualified. You see. So they're TVIs, but when you. Yeah you're qualified see so we call them qtvis over in the uk so i uh, um uh so i run along with my colleague elizabeth uh the qtvi program here in edinburgh and so so we we have developed uh, our 20 credit cvi course which is great which is fantastic and um look how important do you think that every ev not only just tvis but every teacher should have a little bit of understanding about cvi Absolutely. I, every person on the earth needs to know it exists. And right now, I, I give talks and things all the time. And there are some, teachers have never heard of it. Special ed teachers have never heard of it. Our teacher of the visually impaired had never heard of it, didn't even know what it was. And so it's crucial. I think that, I think that pediatricians need to know what it is, not just vision specialists, pediatricians. And I also think because symptoms can just be anxiety, I'm sure there are other people out like Sebastian who are exhibiting symptoms of what appears to be mild or even moderate or severe anxiety, and they appear to be typically sighted. So this is something that everyone needs to know across the board in all medical and educational specialties they need to know and to watch out for it. It's just crucial. Yeah, totally agree. All right, one last thing, one last thing is, look, um, We've been through the journey. We've only been chatting for about an hour, but I believe you've got a book about this. Is that right? So you've got. A... <laughs> I do. Look, look, I've given you a chance to plug your book. All right. So uh, uh, here it is. There it is. And the cover, the best part of this book right here is the cover painted by my son, Sebastian, who is almost completely blind. When he was 16 years old, I think he was 16 when he did that. And he's face blind. And it's called Eyeless Mind, a memoir about seeing and being seen. And it's our true story. So everything that happened. Thank right. you. And that, and that gets published when? Pretty soon or is it out now? Sunday. Sunday. All right. How about that? You know, <laughs> uh, today's what? Today's, I'm looking at my phone, is the uh, 16th of April. Yes. So yeah. on the 19th of April, yes, it, it will be available worldwide. All right, excellent. So, um, look, uh, uh, we've been on a journey together. Uh, um, I guess I know you now, Steph. <laughs> it's a pleasure to meet you, really. Uh, thank no, you I so really, much. I really can't thank you enough for being so honest and open. Uh, uh, and obviously, you've had consent. By the way, I just should mention this you've had consent from uh, uh, Sebastian to talk about him. Just, oh, yes. Just, yeah. Just in case some of the ethics people jump on me and go, eh. <laughs> yeah, okay. no, he's he's fully supportive of changing things regarding CVI and using our story. Yes. Yeah. All right. And um, uh, look, I just want you to have a good weekend. Good luck with the book release. Hope that's, hope that's good. And uh, uh, look, I'll speak to you soon. All right. Thank you so much. It was so good to meet you. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's uh, been a real, real, real learning journey and a real 
caring journey. I think that's the important thing. All right, I'll speak to you soon, Steph. Bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you.